Thank you very much for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, so as highlighted already by the previous speaker, we need um, global and coordinate action to, to combat antimicrobial resistance. And uh, um, so I will focus my talk today on two specific aspects uh, in antimicrobial stewardship and infection control. Um, the first one is whether um, computerized decision support system can help us to uh, prescribe antimicrobials more appropriately. Um, and the second part will uh, focus on the risk for the patient in hospitals to acquire a multidrug resistant organism from the, what we call the, the aquatic reservoir. Some of you may not be uh, familiar, so that's two definitions. The first one is from the WHO, uh, the second one from the European Society of uh, Infectious Disease. And they both highlight um, the strategical and multifaceted aspect of uh, this intervention with the final aim to, to promote a more responsible and more appropriate use of uh, antimicrobials. And do we need uh, antimicrobial stewardship? Um, the answer is yes, certainly. We have now a large amount of data which, which show that uh, both in the community, but also in hospitals. So in the community, uh, it is estimated that almost two thirds of the prescription are um, probably unnecessary. And in hospital, um, it depends in the setting, but between 30 to 50% of the antibiotic used uh, might be inappropriate. So we can, um, we can divide the, the different intervention targeting prescription in two areas. So either before the prescription, and then you can have different action providing guidelines to physicians, trying to, to have diagnostic tools, um, cumulative antibiogram, et cetera. So they can um, choose the most appropriate treatment with the, the good dosage, et cetera. And then we can also have um, intervention that targets the prescription when the antibiotics has already been prescribed, and that's um, interventions such as promoting oral switch, but also um, descala, narrowing the, the spectrum, uh, systematic reevaluation, trying to reduce duration, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so, what is the impact of antibiotic use on IMR? That's something which is um, relatively clear now. Uh, there is an impact. We have many uh, studies we looked, which looked at the risk factor of antibiotic use in IMR. I just cited this um, systematic review that was published already several years ago. It was um, including studies conducted in primary cares, and they very nicely show that if a patient receives an antibiotic, then he is at risk of having resistant bacteria in the next months, but up to 12 months after receiving an antibiotic. And um, that was shown for urinary tract uh, bacteria, but also respiratory tract and uh, skin infection. And um, another similar study, um, systematic review published a bit more recently, which look at the drivers of antimicrobial resistance and um, in different domain. And if we looked at antibiotic use, that um, the, the size of the, of the circle uh, means the number of studies that have been conducted in the field antibiotic exposure was clearly one of the main drivers at the individual level uh, to have a, a, a resistant uh, bacteria. And um, then the next question if, is, if antibiotic use lead to resistance, does it mean that if we now improve um, antimicrobial use that will decrease antimicrobial resistance? So it seems quite trivial and obvious, but it's not a, a, a very um, easy question. And I just want to highlight just a note of caution in the field of uh, AMS research. Um, that's a, a review that included any kind of antimicrobial stewardship study that were conducted without any criteria for quality, et cetera. And most of the studies conducted in the field of AMS are what we call before-after studies without a control group, without appropriate uh, interrupted time series analysis, and they are at high risk of bias. And we can have some very optimistic findings of the study, which are not necessarily um, true. 
And if we looked more specifically at the impact of AMS intervention on antimicrobial resistance, um, very few of these studies actually uh, looked at uh, these uh, outcomes, um, uh, um, either in the hospital or in the community setting. So the good news from this Cochrane review is that any intervention could theoretically improve prescriptions, but that's not only prescription that we want to improve, that's also um, patient outcomes and resistance. And in the same uh, Cochrane review, the conclusion was that there is now a very low certainty of evidence on the impact of AMS uh, intervention and resistance. So it, it's, um, they included 14 different studies with a plan, AMS intervention, properly conducted, and microbiological outcome assessment, and the effect was uh, inconsistent. So it does not mean that there is no effect. It means that it's difficult to assess for various reasons. Uh, first, usually during the study, we have a relatively small number of events. So even if you run a, a randomized trial, you may have a very few acquisition events during the, the study period. Then there is the issue of timeline. We need some longitudinal studies with extensive periods to be able to really assess the impact of on change in pres prescribing behaviors on antimicrobial resistance. There is also um, other confounding factors, such, of course, as any other infection control measure that you will implement that could also have an impact on, uh, on resistance. And finally, on those um, studies, the criteria are usually selected to assess change in prescribing behavior and not microbiological outcomes. And they, they might not be appropriate for specifically uh, assessing the impact on these uh, outcomes. So in, just in summary of this introduction, we know that antibiotic use clearly has an impact on resistance. Uh, antimicrobial stewardship are needed, but it's difficult to assess if appropriate use has a positive impact on, on resistance or not. Um, so, sorry, it's a bit cut. So now we, we know that we need intervention, but it's not so clear yet which intervention, what is the best way to provide this intervention to the prescriber, what is the most cost effective, what is the most efficient way and computerized decision support system might be a solution to implement um, AMS intervention. Um, just a definition of what we call a computerized decision support system. So it's a computerized based tool, which is designed to, to assist healthcare professionals to provide evidence-based guidelines and to make recommendation um, to, 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 provide, to, to prescribe the, the, the more appropriate treatment to the, to the patients. So the problem with um, existing antibiotic stewardship interventions, they are resource intensive, they cover um, usually a minority of prescriptions, they are limited to regular work hour, and they are often occurring when the prescription has already been made, and in a way it, it could be a bit too late. And at the same time, um, you know that more and more we have electronic health records in healthcare setting, now computerized physician order entry is becoming a, a standard. And so um, we could be able to integrate many of these interventions directly at the time of the prescription, such as suggestion for duration, allergy for reminders, oral switch, et cetera, et cetera. So theoretically, these tools could be a potential solution. Um, they may be cheaper in the long term. They cover a large proportion of prescriptions. They are available um, at any time, and they can even... Um, provide advice before the, the, the prescription. Um, but there is still many unanswered questions. We have a few high quality studies. Um, we still don't know about the possible unintended consequence of having these uh, computerized or automated tools. Um, is it accepted by, prescri by prescriber? Um, and finally, is it uh, general as I build up? So, the so IDSA guidelines are still, uh, they, they are recommending to, to, to include this kind of tool. It's a weak recommendation with a moderate quality evidence. Um, WHO, you may have seen this uh, new roadmap published uh, very recently. And um, in, the, in, the, in the roadmap, they highlight stewardship and what of the high impact interventions that uh, they consider is having this kind of um, computerized tool to, to support uh, prescription. Um, 
So it just, or you can design your tool. Basically, you can include any kind of data. So patient-specific data, such as result of microbiological testing, uh, laboratory test, imaging, et cetera, but also local data, um, recommendations, local uh, microbial resistance data, and uh, you include those in, in uh, information in your tool. Ideally, it should be integrated into the, the workflows or into the electronic prescribing and being uh, interoperable with other systems. So do we have any evidence of uh, computer support for appropriate prescribing? Um, so I have mentioned this systematic review published already a few years ago, which um, conclusion were that uh, the, the overall quality was relatively poor. Um, even though there was an increase of appropriate uh, use of antimicrobials, and there was almost no effect if only high quality studies were included. Um, another systematic review with um, quite similar uh, findings, uh, but they still conclude that some moderate to high quality evidence to suggest that it can positively influence uh, prescribing behaviors. And so we conducted this study in, uh, in Geneva with um, also hospitals in uh, Ticino. And that was exactly uh, the, the, this question, uh, whether we can have an impact of, um, on prescribing if we introduce a computerized uh, intervention. Uh, the design was a cluster randomized trial with uh, um, two parallel arms, uh, and the intervention was compared to what we call a standard of care antimicrobial stewardship. Um, that's the computerized multimodal intervention. It was directly integrated into the electronic prescribing, providing support for empiric, also for targeted treatment, for duration, a systematic alert after three days, and also uh, feedback to the prescribers. So overall, we included 24 wards, more than 10,000 patients per arm. Uh, with about 40% of the patients receiving at least one dose of antimicrobial in both arms, and that were um, all the different outcomes that were assessed, so not only um, process outcome, also some clinical and microbiological outcomes. And there was um, unfortunately no difference between the two arms, uh, except for oral switch, which was more frequently performed in the intervention group. So there was no statistical difference, but every um, process outcome was still um, better performed in the intervention arm. So the next question is why did we, why did we lack uh, to have any impact? Um, and probably the first answer, which is really a challenge in this type of system is the uptake by the, by the prescriber. So you think that you know, a physician will be happy to have a new tool, will use it, but in the reality, that's not exactly the case. Um, we also had an issue that because of the design, emergency room was not part of the study, and that's clearly where many of the prescriptions are initiated in the real life, so that was an issue. But also it was not used for about 40% um, of the, 25% of the admission. Um, there was also some design issue, maybe the re-evaluation was too easy to ignore. And also we can argue that in Switzerland, in the, in the, in the hospital where we, we conducted the study, the baseline for prescribing behaviors is already relatively good. And that may also explain um, why we lack this, uh, this impact. And um, I just wanted to highlight that HubTech is, is clearly a challenge. Um, it's rarely reported in the studies that try to assess the impact of these kind of tools. There has been this systematic um, review looking specifically at this question. And uptake is reported in only 12% of the studies. And when it's reported, it's relatively low, only uh, 34%. Um, so of course, for us, the next question is, uh, do, do physician, what do physicians think about this kind of uh, computerized decision support system? We conducted a small, a qualitative study to try to assess the, the perception. And it's true that they, they perceive it frequently at time consuming, but also something that may reduce their autonomy, their professional, um, their critical thinking. They are also afraid to, that it could raise new medical uh, legal issues. And they clearly want a tool that is easy to use, to use speed. Um, and physicians like everyone are 
used to uh, in their daily life to have very efficient tools, so they, they want to have similar tools in their, in their practice. Um, so that's uh, a bit the key point of this uh, first part. So yes, we need intervention to improve uh, antimicrobial prescribing. The quality of the study in uh, AMS is generally poor, and we need to be cautious with some uh, overly optimistic findings. Um, there is still evidence that CDSS may improve appropriateness of prescription, but uh, the studies with robust study design are, are challenging to, to conduct. Um, and the evidence that this kind of intervention improve uh, microbiological outcomes so far is it's quite limited. Um, other uptake is a challenge, and uh, we need to really take uh, into account user expectation when we design this kind of, uh, of tools. So after this, um, this part on digital, digitalized health and automated intervention, um, I will uh, move to the second part, which is more um, ground to earth. I will talk about things. <laughs> And that's um, another um, big issue in, uh, in infection control, uh, actually, and it's gaining more and more attention from the different uh, infection control teams across the world. Um, so the environmental aquatic reservoir and how a patient may be at risk to acquire um, MDRO from this uh, reservoir and how we can control this risk. Um, so I will just start with a small story uh, we had at the um, intensive care unit here in Geneva. Um, that's the epidemic curve of the case of patient who acquire a Pseudomonas aeruginosa vim um, producing organism. So a little bit different from the epidemic curve of uh, COVID, but there was still an outbreak. Um, and uh, the outbreak was detected in summer 2020. And um, without going too much into the details of the investigation, we were able to, to see that there was a link in the ICU between those patients. So we conducted some environmental sampling um, in different uh, things of the, of the unit. And we were able to show that uh, things from this unit were um, contaminated with, um, with a strain of uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa vim. Um, the next step to make it short was to um, completely remove the things. And that's something which is more and more done in several uh, ICU in the world um, to remove things because of the risk of uh, contamination with, with MDRO and the risk of uh, acquisition by the, by the patient. And there have been several um, similar outbreaks reported now in the literature that uh, affect mostly patients that are critically ill or immunocompromised. The most predominant organism that is reported is Pseudomonas aeruginosa, but there is also many different outbreaks with uh, Acinetobacter bomani or various uh, Enterobacterales. And mostly um, the... the, the, the the multidrug resistant organism is identified in the, in the drains, the sinks, and the faucets. And we also have now some evidence that even outside an outbreak context, um, there is a lower risk of acquisition of MDRO if you turn your ICU into a free um, water-free care ICU. So that's um, what, what, what they did in uh, this ICU in Netherlands. They removed all things from patient rooms and they implement water-free um, water care, and they were able to show that uh, the rate of colonization of new acquisition event by the patient was uh, reduced. We also have some experimental data showing that how the patient can uh, get contaminated. So for example, in the study, uh, they put agar plates around the sinks, and uh, they were able to show that after um, similar conditions, they show um, uh, the bacteria that grows um, all over the, the, the place around the counter and more frequently the closer it was uh, from the counter. And we also have some evidence from genomic analysis, for example, here that the, the analysis that was performed uh, in this uh, small outbreak in, uh, in Geneva and the strain from the sinks and from the patient uh, were considered uh, similar. 
So the next question is uh, how to control this risk. Um, well, the easy solution is uh, providing waterless care, but that's not feasible everywhere. And we need to find uh, additional, additional solutions that just showing that each um, care that necessitated tap water could be replaced by uh, an, an alternative. And it was very well uh, adopted, uh, at least in, uh, in Geneva University Hospital. Um, solution two could be to try to have um, a, a design of the things that reduce this splashing. And uh, there is many research that are conducted in this way to find the optimal uh, thing design. Uh, okay, so not, there is just a problem with the slide that I'll mix up, but um, okay. Um, I will go directly here. Um, yeah, sorry, I'm a bit disturbed because all the slides are mixed up, but. Um, you can have also solution with um, with different type of siphon that can um, um, uh, produce uh, repeated heating to at least uh, 40, um, 85 degrees and a specific siphon, which can be a solution um, to, to reduce this contamination issue. Um, the, the graph here um, was supposed to be on another side. It reports several outbreaks. Uh, related to, to the aquatic environment. And what is shown in this study is um, the potential action of bleaching. So you may know that in several ICU in the world, they put some bleach in the sink every seven days or every day. And there is uh, so far limited um, evidence that uh, it's working. Um, yeah, I don't know why it happened. Um, so we conducted um, a study in Geneva that's um, the design of the study represented here. Uh, initially, we sampled um, several clinical wards, uh, sinks and toilets, and all the sinks that were contaminated, we randomized them in three different arms, either to receive a chemical intervention, a thermal intervention, or just to be um, a control. And um, that's the result of the, of the study. Uh, we are not able to show any difference in terms of decontamination in the three arms, meaning that this, um, this uh, behavior to put things, to put bleach in things um, might not be uh, that efficient. Um, sorry, again, for the slide, I don't know what's happened. Um, so there is also some uh, concern about uh, bleach that may induce some, um, some increase in the biofilm formation, some change in cell morphology um, by different uh, mechanisms. And that's another area of, uh, of uh, research now that, uh, that, that could be a concern to put this uh, biocide bio because they may uh, increase biofilm formation. And that's what we observed also in our study uh, in the arm where we put this uh, bleach, there was the highest level of recontamination, contrary to what we would have uh, expected. Uh, and finally, a comprehensive approach. It's also just to highlight that some very basic measures. So, for example, that picture of sinks in clinical unit, and you can see that they are really crowded with materials, and materials can become contaminated, and the patient can that get contaminated. So we also need to regularly um, train the healthcare worker about this risk of, you know, the thing could be a, 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 at risk for the patient to get uh, contaminated. And uh, clearly it's, it's a study which illustrates that things are not always properly used. Um, it's um, in these studies, they had more, almost 3000 videos of healthcare worker <laughs> using things. And uh, it was used to wash hands only on 4% of occasion. <laughs> and they were really able to show that many activities were observed and they were putting uh, some nutrients or fluids into the thing that could lead to the contamination because it brings to the, to the microorganism some uh, nutrients. Um, so the key point of this second part, so the contamination of the aquatic reservoir by Andero, it's clearly a, an overlooked risk, not, not so much overlooked now because it's gaining more and more attention. And uh, waterless is clearly an option what's feasible, but it's, uh, it's not always the case. And we need to find 
um, new decontamination strategies <coughs> or new approaches to, to mitigate um, this risk um, by, uh, by different strategies. So thank you very much for your attention. And also I want to thank uh, many people who are involved in the project that I have uh, shown here. Thank you. <laughs>